Um, before I start, uh, I would like to tell you that I do not have anything to disclose. And I would like to thank the Eurodynamics Committee for giving us this opportunity. And also I would like to thank my uh, co-authors, Dr. Oktay Demirkesen, Dr. Uh, Mauricio Plata, and da Dr. David Castro-Diaz for their um, collaboration and support. So the title of our teaching module is Deficit Point Pressures in Patients with Relevant Neurological Abnormalities. The basis of our information regarding data surge leak point pressure or is originating from McGuire studies uh, from 1981. These were retrospective observations, video aerodynamic studies of children with myelomeningocele and urinary incontinence secondary to impaired bladder compliance. The basic purpose of these observations was to define a certain uh, cutoff value of that cervical point pressure where we can predict the upper urinary tract deterioration. However, this concept was further applied to different etiologies of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, also in adult patients. The ICS today defines the that cervical point pressure as follows. The lowest detrusor pressure at which urine leakage occurs in the absence of either a detrusor contraction or increased abdominal pressure, according to the t last terminology report published in 2002. However, uh, today we see several controversies uh, regarding the measurement and clinical interpretation of detrusor leak point pressures. For example, the cutoff value of that cervical point pressure um, to predict the upper unit tract damage is uh, debatable. And measuring the LPP lacks standardization today and carries certain pitfalls. And it, today we see that in many um, studies, uh, the LPP in neurogenic lower unit tract dysfunction uh, has been misused as that cervical contractions. Uh, instead of uh, reduced bladder compliance. So this uh, ICS Eurodynamic teaching module consists of a, a webcast presentation in combination with the uh, manuscript and a standard education of good Eurodynamic practice for everyone who is caring for patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. My presentation will focus basically on testing requirements, clinical workup, workup and analysis. The manuscript additionally focuses on scientific uh, background uh, and review of the uh, present um, literature. And one of our aims in this presentation is to standardize and improve the method of the LPP measurement in patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction to minimize performer and patient dependent variations. We have um, taken the two very important reports into the consideration when we have worked on this module. The first one is the ICS report on good urodynamic practices, and the second one is the International Children's Continent Society's report on the standardization of the terminology of lower urinary tract dysfunction. The standard urodynamic equipment um, is uh, has been found um, in our uh, review um, as an appropriate one, and I'm not going to talk about the details of it because this has been very well described in other reports and also in previous teaching modules. The patient's investigation uh, should sp start in spine position with an empty bladder. We have also to say that ICS recommends sitting position in suitable patients, and this is recommended with a degree of B. However, there is no evidence for the influence of specific positioning of patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction on the dead sir leak point pressure. We know that using progressively larger catheters increase the measurement of the LPP. So small size catheters are uh, always preferred. The rule should be as thin as possible and one catheter systems supported with the uh, level of evidence of four. 
Today, the most of the studies are being performed uh, with five to eight French double lumen systematic catheters with water systematry. We also have seen that underestimation of DLPP is possible when suprapubical catheter is used. There is no standardization uh, about the filling rate in the ICS Good Urodynamic Practice Report. It is usually done with a rate dependent on age in children um, that, that may be calculated by different uh, methods. And register adaptation to volume may be challenged in high filling rates. Therefore, our committee um, prefers the slow, um, the slow, medium filling rate in these studies. Although ICS has classified, is not, is, ICS doesn't uh, use this classification anymore, as you know. Um, the uh, ICS classifies the filling rates as physiologic and uh, non-physiologic um, today after the last uh, report. In order to calculate the optimal infusion rate, day-to-day -day bladder capacity may be calculated using voiding diaries or catheterization diary volumes. Five to 10% of known predicted capacity may be used in children. And especially um, our uh, committee have, uh, thinks that slow filling rate in adult neurogenic patients with a non-hypocompliant bladder is important, supported by the expert opinion. Infusion pump devices rather than gravity type infusion uh, systems uh, are advocated to avoid iatrogenic bladder pressure increases. The influence of fluid temperature on that surly point pressure has never been studied. More accurate representation of bladder activity with natural fill, that is maybe the ambulatory one, uh, natural fill systematry uh, in children may be achieved. Another problem, in, another problem exists about the detection of the urinary leakage. One way of doing that may be one person observing for leak leakage and another observing the recording and marking pressures. There may be a more accurate fluoroscopic visualization of the contrast around the catheter in videodynamic studies. Another question that we have uh, tried to answer was how, how and when to stop the systometry. There was no strong data in the literature to answer this question. It is our uh, belief that systometry may be stopped when the dead surface pressure exceeds 40 centimeters of water to prevent uh, complications and uh, to uh, protect the upper urinary tract. Or a maximum bladder volume at intermittent catheterization is reached can be another stop point. Or some orders uh, have uh, stopped the systometry during their studies when a strong uh, neurogenic detusor overactivity contraction has occurred. Not all systometry in this patient in this patient group ends with leakage. Sometimes, or in many cases, systometry is ended without leakage, and the orders uh, of this teaching module um, have uh, decided to uh, mark this point as end filling pressure, as it was shown in many um, studies. There is a neurogenic tetrasor overactivity leak point pressure, which has not been defined yet. This is something that we propose as a new, um, new terminology. The, if leakage occurs with an episode of neurogenic tetrasor overactivity any time during filling systometry. In non-neurogenic patients, uh, it has been previously defined as tetrasor overactivity leak point pressure. Although the aim of this presentation is not to uh, talk about basic pathophysiology, I would like to uh, sh show some uh, data about it. The LPP is the pressure which overwhelms the bladder outlet resistance and causes urinary leakage. It reflects the resistance of the bladder outlet or the external sphincter. And the basic uh, ideology uh, that high that leak point pressure 
puts the upper urinary tract into risk is a valid one. However, there is no certain cutoff value that we can rely 100% on it. The accepted cutoff values that we use today, especially the macroires, 40 centimeters of water, doesn't have a high level of evidence. In our treatment policies, reduction of outlet resistance for improving safe ladder storage and preserving uh, uh, upper track is, um, <coughs> is targeted. For this, finding an absolute value of the LPP is very important of us. However, is it really possible? There are not many studies uh, that have investigated uh, the cutoff values of the LPPs. One study has shown that uh, there was no upper urinary tract deterioration of many patients with the LPPs of 40 centimeters of water in the long-term follow-up. Another study in children has shown that 20 centimeters of water as the cutoff value for the LPP was better than 40 centimeters to predict the risk uh, of upper urinary tract deterioration, as you see on the table. There are so many answers that we have to uh, answer re regarding the clinical implications and basic pathophysiology. One is, what is the clinical significance of that sort of overactive leak point pressure versus the conventional DLPP in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction with low compliance? There has been, there was a study which showed that significant association with hydronephrosis uh, in patients occurs when the neuro neurogenic tersor overactivity exceeds 75 um, millimeters of uh, water. Of course, the total duration of the tersor overactivity contractions uh, are also very uh, important. In this study, the only statistical significant urodynamic variable for upper tract dilatation and visco-urethral reflux uh, has been found the duration of the tersor overactivity contractions. However, the level of evidence in both of these studies was not high. The treatment of patients with a high uh, DLPP uh, is uh, indicated to reduce the number and amplitude of overactive dead cell contractions and uh, targets improving the bladder compliance. Another target uh, may be um, to uh, expose the urinary tract for a shorter period of time to high pressure in between bladder emptying periods with or without CIC. Therefore, it is very important to know in these patients uh, the CIC schedule. As I said, significant numbers of patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction do not leak during the study where the enfilling pressure uh, should be noted. Uh, this has been shown in one study with an increased bladder wall thickness and increased urinary levels of TGF-beta-1, NGF, and TIMP. These biomarkers have been uh, very promising uh, in the future to replace maybe some of the urodynamic parameters that we use today. So, the LPP, a part of systematic evaluation of children and adults with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, to help predicting or predicting or preventing upper urinary tract dysfunction has been recommended uh, by, uh, with a grade of B or C uh, as the result of our teaching uh, module. Recommendations of ICS and ICCS should be followed today for systematic equipment and for the measurement technique. Discrimination of high-risk patients on the basis of the LPP has been recommended again with the grade of B or C. However, we have to note that the LPP should not be used as the sole parameter to decide on invasive therapies in this patient group, such as bladder augmentation or sphincterotomy. Other factors that predict upper urinary tract dysfunction should be combined, such as bladder compliance, volume where leakage occurs, duration and amplitude of dead cell contractions, and volume that is obtained by CIC. It should be known that there is a low sensitivity of traditional cutoff 
for the LPP that was 40 centimeters of water for the prediction of upper urinary tract dysfunction in this patient group. Future research to standardize the technique and better classify the LPP cutoffs is certainly needed. The predictive value of the LPP may further differ depending on the uh, different underlying pathologies, such as myelomeningocele, multiple sclerosis, or spinal cord injury patients. So therefore, these patients' group should be uh, evaluated separately, and they should not be put into the same basket. I would like to show you, finally, um, an example of the Eurodynamic study, um, and uh, again, uh, make it more clear uh, what, what the difference is between the DLPP and neurogenic or our activity associated with DLPP. Um, here, this is the DLPP according to the definition of ICS, where there is no increase in the uh, vesicle and the abdominal uh, pressure. Where here, however, there is a neurogenic tetrasur overactivity, and when the, there the leakage occurs, unfortunately, in many um, examples, that has been today reported as the LPP, however, it is not. So we have to differentiate at least between these two phenomena. And filling pressure should be taken into consideration if the leakage does not occur during systometry. However, the clinical relevance of EFP is not clear. I would like to thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you for, uh, for your presentation, Professor Takan. So, neurogenic detrusal leak point pressure, or detrusal leak point pressure in neurogenic patients. Uh, we can have a short discussion. If somebody wants to ask a specific question, you are welcome. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you a question. So, take care. Okay, the question for you is, who is doing your dynamics in for neurogenic patients? You are. You are. Are you using the trusal leak point pressure? So, is this helpful for you to teach what is the knowledge? And is there anything that you miss in this presentation? That you tell me that you do things different? So you, uh, you, you have another strategy. Go to the mic, please. You do have a question. Can you use the mic? Yep. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, when you are doing the study and the, the, the bladder starts firing and start, the patient starts leaking, and he leaks to the point that he empties his blood, okay, and then this even starts happening again and again. When do you start? Do, do you decide to stop? And this is mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. one of them you pick as the. Okay. Uh, we are talking about neurogenic patients. Is yes. that right? Okay. Uh, so can you stay at the microphone? At the microphone for a moment. Okay. Um, this is again, uh, you know, uh, I, I can answer this only at a very low level of evidence because if you look to the literature, there is no answer uh, to your question. However, um, in this in these patients, uh, what we are doing is, uh, in my own clinical practice, uh, we uh, repeat it uh, two or three times. Uh, if we see that we have the same result after all these uh, repeat systometries, and we stop it. You have to stop it after leakage occurs. You should not continue your uh, systometric filling. And empty it, and then start again. Oh, I have a question for you. What do you do? I do it like two or three times just to make sure that it's 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 really happening. Yep. And then I stop. So, and what do you decide about the leak point at that moment? The the the, the, the minimum, the, the least pressure, the minimum. Yep. The the, Good. The so pressure. that's what you do as well. Yeah. I, so I think I should we have something like that into the slides? So yeah, maybe. Yeah. And add this. Yeah. So thanks a lot for your comments. You have another comment. Yes, please. Good. Well, you're welcome. It's an observation I've noticed once. I don't know if it's related, if this is related to the subject. Uh, I was doing a study one time, and I was doing it in the spine position. It's a, she's a neurogenic lady. And she, the, the curve was going very smooth and no, no problem. And then I put her in sitting position, and she started firing. 
Does the position differ? Uh, this was uh, covered uh, in the manuscript as well as in the presentation. There is no data about it. No. The, uh, I can show you, uh, but if you remember the slides, um, the uh, ICS requires the sitting position whenever it is possible. However, the effect of position on the LPP measurement has not been studied yet. There is actually so little that has been studied about the LPP since 1980s and we have uh, taken all these cutoff values as you know uh, unchangeable rules uh, to our clinical uh, practice however it lacks really a good uh, level of evidence but now the, the two new emerging studies have shown that the, this cut of level uh, is not true and um, in the manuscript, I think we will have the opportunity more focus on the basic pathophysiology and the upper urinary tract deterioration is not only depending on the LPP, of course, to other factors, the duration of the pressure that the bladder is exposed to, uh, the amplitude and so the many other things, of course. And again, the etiology is also very important, the etiology. So you may be right about the position and there are definitely individual variations and, and effects on, on uh, while repositioned. However, there's no good evidence, so we cannot put that in, in, in an evidence-based educational module. And that's a bit of our problem. The lack of evidence is, is more stringent problem than the mm -hmm. practice. And we start off with this practice. And I think if everybody follows the practice, we will see the evidence for what happens. And then we can collect the evidence and write a new practice. I think this is the way to go forward. And maybe we will have new evidence in five years, and then you have to rewrite and represent. Yeah. OK, that's the deal. Uh, there's the other thing. That is the filling rate. You, dis you mentioned some things about filling rate. How do you all decide on filling rate in the neurogenic patient? Who decides on filling rate on the basis of something like avoiding diary or catheter volumes that, that are known to you? Nobody of you. So you just push one filling rate for every patient. So that might be good practice, but there's no evidence. That's my answer, and yeah. that's that's in the module as well. So, okay, okay, that's a way to to do it. So you start with the standing filling. That was the comment. Start with the standard, and if it, if something happens, adapt it. But I basically do not know what's going to happen, what you make adapted, make adapting, and then... Compliance changes will, will start the study over, will adjust the filling rate, so you can yeah. say that compliance issues... So, and then you slow down the filling rate. So we have a discussion now, so adapt it while doing it, and then you slow down the filling, filling rate, and you en will end up with a slightly bigger capacity, is it? Mm -hmm. But does it change management in that case? I, I doubt. There's, there's not much evidence. So I can say yes and you can say no and the other way around. We have no evidence for that. So we have to collect evidence. What's the, what's the filling rate in influencing what we are seeing? Exactly. This is very well actually included in the manuscript as well at this point. Yeah. So that's the other thing. And who does video? That's my last question. I'm not going to bother you. So you do video. What is more important, that you see the leakage outside or around the catheter in the, in the video? You, you look for leakage around the catheter, and that's one second before leakage into the funnel of the flumator or seeing leakage. And does that change, that one second, your diagnosis? Is it worthwhile, the video? Yeah. 
So you need radiation exposure for that. There's a little bit of evidence in the, in the literature. Yeah, my, my personal uh, opinion is that video is not very much needed in the uh, measurement of uh, DLPP. Comp of course, again, I mean, expert, there's no uh, strong level of evidence to support this. I think video aerodynamic studies are especially important in children with uh, myelodysplasia when we also consider the reflux into the concentration. I think this is the most important point of aerodynamic studies. Anything to be said about the true liquid pressures in neurogenic patients? You can now stand up or be silent for the next five years. Now is the chance to change practice in the world. Okay, use the mic. Use the mic, please. Yeah. The effect of the. I'm, 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 have you mentioned that in the uh, I did. the temperature and the there's temperature. no evidence? Yes, actually, yes. I, I, I'm, I may be confused between the manuscript and here, but we have uh, mentioned it. Who and uses another no. temperature for neurogenic patients than patients without neurogenics? Who does use warm water? You use warm, warm contrast. Yeah. So. Okay, there's another comment. It's the same comment, but I think that urodynamics are, are going through a good urodynamic practice uh, from the ICS, so uh, there is no, no change in temperature of good urodynamic practice size. Okay, there's no, there's no, there's no evidence that, that temperature is relevant. That, that we agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Peter, just maybe one last comment. Uh, uh, my co-authors are not here because they are speaking in some other uh, meet uh, talks. So uh, I, the uh, authors um, have, uh, uh, they wanted actually me to strongly mention that the uh, clean intermittent catheterization uh, volumes are very important um, uh, in the interpretation of urodynamic studies. In this patient group especially, if you just focus on the urodynamic results, we will fail. Okay, especially uh, to protect the upper urinary tract. We have to put the CIC schedule in front of us and see the volumes, how the, the kid or uh, the patient is doing, and then we can predict maybe how much the bladder and the urinary tract is exposed uh, to pressure just looking at the volume. So I think this is a very important I point. couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and by the lack of evidence, I think this is nevertheless the new standard that we take in account that w whatever we know from the patient uh, to start off the, doing the urodynamics. And that at best, at, at, at least is a volume diary or a volume diary uh, based on catheter volume yeah. or voided volume or whatever. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay.